Every few years, pathogens infect people around the globe. There was SARS in 2003, swine flu, that came about in 2009. Ebola, that occurred in 2014. Then Zika arrived in 2016. And as we all know, the world was ravaged in 2019 by COVID. So what's next? And is the world ready? I talk with Maureen Miller, an infectious disease epidemiologist at Columbia University in New York City. I met with Maureen at the school's Barnard College. For nearly 30 years, he's researched contagious viruses. I started as an HIV prevention researcher. So there's a global pandemic right there. And we don't think of HIV necessarily as a pandemic, and it's certainly a different kind of pandemic than the one we're experiencing right now because it's a long, slow process. This one, boom, bounced around the world um, in really a, a matter of a month. So this one works very differently than that one, but still there are shared ideas in terms of how an epidemic, how a pandemic works. You probably saw this freight train coming and started to tell people early on, but it's hard to get across that point of view, isn't it? People did not want to hear it at that time. It just seems so unbelievable. It's like science fiction. And interestingly, the first people to reach out to me were hedge fund managers and multinationals. And they said, okay, tell us the unvarnished truth. We want to know really how long should we expect this to last? And dead silence at the end of the phone. Because my, my initial estimates were 18 months. And I'm turning out to be wrong. It's going to be longer than that. I thought um, by perhaps the end of this year, we would be settled. And parts of the United States will be settled by that time. Parts of Europe will be settled by that time. Meanwhile, we've already surpassed the number of deaths this year um, globally compared with 2020. So a lot of people are dying, a lot of people are getting sick, and a lot of people are not yet getting vaccinated or even have access to the vaccines. Give me a sense, uh, somebody who's in your field who understands all of this, and I think <laughs> we're starting to understand it, even lay people like myself. When did you first say to yourself, man, this is gonna be huge? Uh, beginning of January of 2020, when they said, when it was announced to the world that there was a severe acute respiratory infection circulating, boom, that's bad news. Already it means it's airborne. Um, there were different areas where it was popping up. Um, it was sequenced in record time. China does not do anything uh, rashly. This was a consolidated, thoughtful action with the beginnings of a recognition that something really, truly awful was happening. It's interesting, I remember uh, working in, in Wuhan's shutdown, um, this huge city, so many people. And I remember turning to colleagues and saying, you, know, you could never see that in the United States. And then w we saw it here in the US. I mean, uh, this concept of a lockdown, did you kind of see that coming as well? Uh, I saw the need for very serious and rapid action. And I was disappointed not to see the seriousness of this virus addressed for quite some time. Were you also disappointed that scientists all of a sudden became vilified? I mean, that, that it became politicized, of course. Of course, of course, because meanwhile, we just chug along and do our work in the background and things happen or are under control. They don't get to above the radar so that everybody knows about it. Um, and then the, the big chance when we know, when we have information, when we have some answers, when we have the beginnings of a clue as to really how to deal with the situation, then all of a sudden we're the bad guys. That was hard. Maureen is internationally recognized for her contributions to infectious disease research and policy. She's worked closely with international scientists, including those in China, to help prevent the next pandemic. We've had Ebola, we've had MERS, we've had SARS, but we've never really, I mean, you go back to the 
the flu epidemic in 1918 uh, here in the United States, which just coursed through the country, at two waves actually, killed so many people. But it was so far removed that people kind of felt like that's just not going to happen. And people in your field have been telling us over and over again, and, and we need to be cognizant that this could happen. Uh, it, you know, how difficult was it to be in your profession and keep telling people, look, this, this could happen, and then to have it actually happen, and then, as you said, people ignoring the science? Yeah, no, I, I yeah, 100 years ago, I mean, we didn't really, as an epidemiologist, I didn't really know about the pandemic in 1918 until really the early 90s when people had started, hey, wait a second, something horrible happened. And, you know, I mean, everybody has family stories where <laughs> there's holes or something, or there was a lot of shifting of children um, that, you know, once we started talking about that pandemic, it's, wait, this was something really awful and we had never heard of it. So I think from the 90s on, infectious disease epidemiologists in particular really started to worry about it. But the World Health Organization already knew that animal to human virus uh, transmission was going to be a problem and could potentially cause pandemics in the future 70 years ago. They set up a network of hospitals and laboratories to monitor the globe to catch at early stages um, some kind of pandemic threat. And the zoonotic uh, viruses uh, are, are more of a threat now, aren't they? I mean, we're encroaching more on, on the territory of these animals. There's the merging of both of us. The potential's there, right? Oh, it's happening faster and faster and faster. And that's a hallmark of the 21st century. We've had already uh, the SARS pandemic of 2003, the huge regional Ebola epidemic. I mean, those are unheard of in uh, the 20th century. So it's only going to happen more and more quickly and cost us um, both in politics and in economics. I mean, if we have to shut down again, it's gonna be horrible. So I am trying with others to prevent the next pandemic from happening. And I believe we have the tools to do that. And curiously enough, as people were getting vaccinated for COVID-19, the next pandemic could actually, the threat's out there now, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And we don't have a clue right now which, which part of the world it's going to come from, what kind of virus it's going to be. As we've experienced with, uh, with COVID-19, respiratory viruses are the worst um, in terms of being able to move quickly around the globe now that we're so interconnected. So China and the rest of the world needs to cooperate in a positive way. And there have been scientific relations um, with the entire world and China since the 1970s. It's just now that things are getting even more complicated. You say in a positive way, but it seems to me that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to watch her for almost a decade now. Uh, it seems like it's very easy to vilify China and point fingers at China. And China's always seen through this negative lens in the West. Um, that's not the best way to get cooperation and to get people working together. I mean, what suggestions would you make? I absolutely agree that politics has uh, made the relationship adversarial. Public health scientists, however, have worked collaboratively and would be working collaboratively right now if that was at all possible. Uh, there was just a, a, an article in The Lancet of a, a collaborative group from uh, China and the United States saying, look, we work together really well. We want to continue working. This is scary stuff. We want to not have a pandemic and we could prevent it. As scientists look for the exact origin of the coronavirus, one claim is that it originated in a Chinese laboratory. Although several scientists around the world dispute that hypothesis, including Maureen. You've worked with scientists in Wuhan. Uh, you've heard the theories that it was a lab leak that caused all of this. You and I have been talking about genotic, uh, the jump from animal to humans. What's your sense of, of how we got to where we are today? Uh, I think the reality is that most pandemics in human history have resulted 
from animal to human viral spillover. I mean, that's just the nature of pandemics. Um, the idea that um, the virus, which was first discovered in Wuhan, actually originated in Wuhan is unlikely. There is a 97% genetic agreement between a SARS-like coronavirus that bats carry in Yunnan with the human SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID. They are very, very closely related. But in evolutionary terms, that's pretty far apart. Yet, this bat was found in Yunnan. There's evidence that suggests that it may have been circulating in southern China in uh, 2015, 16, 17. The virus that they were finding in Wuhan was already two mutations away. So it was farther away. So there's evidence that it was in southern China. Why was it discovered in Wuhan? Because they have the scientific expertise to be able to identify it. They have um, Sheng Li Shi, who is fondly known in China as the bat woman. So there's all this medical expertise. It's the scientific center of China. You talked about Dr. Shi. Uh, she was quoted in the New York Times because uh, she's been under a lot of attack about this. And she said, how on earth can I offer up evidence for something where there is no evidence? Um, it really is kind of difficult for the people who work in that lab to try and defend themselves when it's just this accusation. And yet you have a lot of people like yourself who say, no, it probably jumped from an animal to a human. Um, and most scientists also agree with that, that idea. That's not published a lot in the media. The, there is a call to determine, um, to have an investigation at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. I think that would be wise to be able to do that. But honestly, I don't believe they would be able to find anything because the other theory is so much more likely, and that's the one that's getting pushed aside right now, that it was a zoonotic spillover from an animal to a human. And in fact, um, an international group of scientists suggest that, yep, it went through an intermediary animal, but really where it got adapted was in human populations, and it just moved and moved. Dead ended someplace, an old person um, died of pneumonia in some remote area and didn't transmit it to somebody else. Um, her son didn't know he was infected and transmitted it to everybody else he worked with, but nobody got sick. I mean, that's exactly what's happening now with the coronavirus. So of course it is likely that it happened that way in China as well, and then moved to Wuhan where it was discovered. Maureen believes one way to prevent outbreaks is to monitor people where disease spillover actually happens instead of waiting for sick people to show up at a hospital. By the time people make it to the hospital, is it already too late? It's too late. I'm, again, it's the influence and persistence of the doctor to convince authorities. But even more than that, uh, it's already, there's an outbreak. An outbreak has already occurred. People are sick. People may be dying in a remote area. So it takes a long time to get to a Sentinel hospital like the one in Wuhan. So people were likely sick and dying long before it was found in Wuhan. Do you think that this is gonna spark a new interest, do you think? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You're already seeing it, you think? Um, I've, you know, you're seeing it more in medical schools. People want to be helpful, and they've learned that the helping professions are really important. But I think as science begins to dominate again, more and more people are gonna be inclined to become epidemiologists. And you've always had a love for this. Has it heightened more because of the pandemic, in a sense? I'm bad, I can't resist a good epidemic, I really can't. Um, so I would say, no, I'm more horrified at what pandemics can really do, having never lived through one. But um, no, I'm, I'm a lifer, I'm, in, I'm into this and I'm gonna stay working in this field and hopefully prevent the next one. And while the next virus outbreak is likely already lurking, Maureen believes there is a simple strategy to prevent it. So what's the big concern right now? I mean, you're talking about variants and we keep hearing that they, they keep mutating and changing and that's the nature of a virus, I guess. What's your greatest fear? My greatest fear is that right now we have almost 8 billion people in the population. 
back of the envelope figure, at the outside, one billion people have been infected or vaccinated. That leaves seven billion more people for this virus to churn through. I, I worry that we're going to get variants that um, will evade the current vaccines that we have and that we may not be able to keep up. That scares me, that keeps me awake at night, and it's going to kill people, a lot of people that didn't have to die. At this stage in the pandemic, that's, that's the answer we have. So people wear masks, people social distance, and people get vaccinated. Those are the tools we have at hand. And that's scary. Um, my thesis is that pandemics are not inevitable. We should really, really invest in preventing the next one because it's not gonna be another 100 years before it shows up. Let me close with this question. Uh, looking back on all of this uh, and with the knowledge that you had uh, going into this and, and seeing just how scary this was gonna be, what's your biggest fear now in terms of like us not getting it, you know? Uh, and when I say us, I mean policy people and leaders. Uh, and if they were to sit down with you and you were to give them like, look, here's my, my list of the five things you guys have gotta think about going forward, what might that look like? That list is put funds towards prevention. There are all kinds of scientists around the world who are interested in prevention. That's why Sheng Li w was amenable to creating something so bizarre she had, that she hadn't even thought about it. An antibody test for humans based on a bat virus. Like, what? <laughs> you know, so there are people who are very interested in never seeing this happen again, who have the skills to make sure that it doesn't happen again. We are not funded. So that's number one. And number two, pandemics are not inevitable. You have to do the right things. I mean, do you really want to prepare and respond and then have those that whole response just crumble to the ground because it's overwhelming? It is overwhelming. The best cure to a pandemic is prevention. It will always be the case. <laughs> it will always be the case that prevention is cheaper than allowing a disease to happen. Because the cost of disease is not just the disease itself, it's the impact that it has on economics, on politics, on human dread, you know, quite honestly. Um, so yeah, prevention is the cure. It is the only cure, and we do have to work together as a global community. We'll leave it there. Thanks so much. <laughs> okay, great.